Galatians chapter 2, speaking uh, tonight, freedom from bondage. And I want you to notice uh, how the Lord presents that in this chapter about us being in bondage, especially here as he speaks to us about the law of Moses. Uh, Paul said he went up to Jerusalem, and uh, he did it after he had been three years down in Arabia uh, at uh, the Seminary of Jesus down uh, where he got taught all of the wonderful truths of the Scripture. And after three years then, he came back up uh, to Damascus and then came down to Jerusalem, and then he went back and went into the ministry doing all the different things he was doing, building churches and all, Fourteen years later, now he says in verse 1, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach, which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was to Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when Peter of James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, Perceive the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. That we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Uh, in the passage we have before us here, the Apostle Paul said, I, I went up to Jerusalem after 14 years, and uh, if you remember reading through the book of Acts, that's chapter 15. And uh, in the book of Acts chapter 15, uh, the reason that uh, Paul came from Antioch and went up to Jerusalem to meet with them was because of these Judaizers, these people who had followed Paul in the establishing of his churches. And after these people had been saved and baptized and he had ordained uh, pastors and deacons and they had churches going in each one of these cities, these Judaizers came in and they were false apostles, false teachers, and told the people, you've got to keep the law now in order to be saved. You can't be saved without keeping the law of Moses. And if you believe that you're saved uh, without that, then you've got to remember you've got to keep the law after you're saved in order to live as you ought to live. And so he's putting these people back in bondage under the law of Moses. Now, you remember these same group of people were the ones that uh, made 613 laws out of the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and so these people wanted to be in absolute control of these lives of all these people. Now, did, did you know that is a fact that of human nature, those uh, who are in leadership many times want to have absolute control over those under them? Right. You watch that. Uh, and people like Jimmy Jones, a, a false prophet, a false teacher, uh, had such control over people that he would lead them down to Jonestown, remember? And they drank that poison Kool-Aid, and, and uh, several hundred of them died because of that. And, uh, of course, false doctrine always leads to death, and, and that's the way it is. But uh, let me say this to you. We have liberty in Christ. Those who are saved have been set free and we are no longer under any circumstances under the law of Moses, either for salvation or for sanctification or growth in grace. We are free from the law. Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And uh, when he says circumcision here, he's talking about people under the law. And when he says the heathen, he's talking about all the rest of us. 
My mom used to say that, yeah, <laughs> about the rest of us. But you understand that what he is saying here is that we who are saved are not under the law. We are not saved by keeping the law, and we're not perfected in our Christian life by the law of Moses. Now, we're going to read on from verse 11. And when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Peter was an apostle like the rest of them. He came up to Antioch. Paul was there. The Lord had blessed that church at Antioch in such a wonderful way. It was growing and growing and growing. People were being saved and baptized by the hundreds, even by the thousands. And that was from there that the apostle Paul went out into, on his missionary trips. And he would leave Antioch and go on one day. He'd come back to Antioch and make a missionary report. Then he'd go out on a second trip and he'd come back. And uh, he, it was headquarters for the great evangelistic movement in that day. And so Peter came up from Jerusalem and said, I want to come up there and uh, find out what's going on up here in Antioch. So he comes up, and when he got there, uh, something happened. Watch it, verse 12. For before that certain came from James, and that was down in Jerusalem, James is the head of the council there, uh, he did eat with the Gentiles. <laughs> Now, Peter understood that salvation is by grace, and he understood that as a Jew, he was no longer under the law. And man, he's sitting up there and enjoying those ham sandwiches and those pork chops and that bacon for breakfast every day. And he's just having a big old time. I mean, just enjoying himself. And, and Peter said, man, we're not under the law. We're under grace. And man, what a good time he was having. He said, fix him green beans. Put some ham in that thing for some flavor. And, you know, fix that stuff up right. Well, something happened, though. When these people came up from James, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He had fear of those people who were coming up from Jerusalem who believes you have to keep the law, and so Peter became a hypocrite. That's what he did. I mean, this great one that some people call him the, the first pope, that's a joke. We don't have any record. He was ever in Rome. Not a single historical record he ever made it to Rome. And certainly he wasn't in Rome uh, when Paul wrote the letter to Rome because he didn't even mention him. And he mentioned all those other saints and didn't mention him at all. Uh, but now he's up at Antioch, and man, he's enjoying life. And when these other Jews come up, he separates himself from those Gentiles. And uh, now he says, fellas, put away that ham. Get, get rid of Hide that pork chops. Get over. We've got to be like, we've got these bunch of Jews come up here. Hey, man, don't you, don't you know we've got to be kosher? And so they put away all that stuff and brought out all the kosher stuff. And they had those uh, kosher hot dogs and... And uh, here they are, and when Paul found out what was going on, look what happened. And before, they, uh, before James came up, they did eat with the Gentiles, but he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing those which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Did you know what that word dissimulation means? Hypocrisy. It means saying one thing in front of some people and saying a different thing in front of other people. It was, he was a hypocrite. And Paul the Apostle says that to Peter. Peter, you're a hypocrite, man. You're eating with all these Gentiles up here and enjoying those ham sandwiches with some cheese and a little mayonnaise. You're having a great time. And now these other Jews come up and you separate yourself like you would never touch one of those things and you're kosher. You hypocrite. Watch what he says. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? 
Now, while you were here, you were living just like all these Gentiles. You were enjoying the wonderful food that they were enjoying and having a great time. When these other Jews come up, now you're forcing all these Gentiles here to live like the Jews. You hypocrite. Boy, he's talking clear, isn't he? He's straightening him out. He says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. And he said, knowing, look at verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Uh, you know, he repeats, and then he repeats, and then he comes back and repeats again to make sure you understand that nobody has ever been justified by keeping the law. By the works of the law, no flesh has ever been justified. On the net from time to time, you will see people who are saying that uh, you people who call yourself Christians, don't you know you ought to be obeying the law? Don't you be able to obey the law of Moses? And some of them are trying to put Christians under the Old Testament Sabbath. And as I mentioned before, the Sabbath was never given to the Gentile nations. The Sabbath was given as a sign to the Jewish people, as a sign that they were God's chosen people. Never, ever given to the Gentile nations. And understand, it is still Saturday. The Sabbath is Saturday. It's always been Saturday. It always will be Saturday. And uh, those false teachers have said, well, you Gentiles, you changed the Sabbath to Sunday. No, we did. The Sabbath is still Saturday. It's always been Saturday. Always will be Saturday. And Sunday is the Lord's Day, the day of the resurrection. We meet together in honor of a living Savior. We are no longer under the law. We are under grace. And so we meet on the day of the resurrection and we worship Christ. And of course, you know, we ought to worship him seven days a week. Amen. Right? Everybody understands that. But we are those who worship and corporately come together on the Lord's day, not under the Old Testament Sabbath. Somebody told me one time that there was a group called the Seventh-day Baptist. I said, that's the most oxymoronic statement I ever heard. Baptists believe the Bible. Why would they meet on Saturday? That doesn't make a lick of sense. They ought to change their name. You know, we believe the book. And we're free from the law. We've never been under the law. And we're not going under the law now. Okay? Everybody got it. All right, read what he said. But while, verse 17... But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. If we, who are justified by Christ, now we got to go back under the law in order to be justified. We don't want these Jews to think ill of us, and so we're going to start keeping the law and put away all those pork chops. And he said, if we do that, we're going back against everything we stood for, that we're free in Christ. We're hypocritical in so doing. And then he said, God forbid, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I build again, going back under the law, and tell people I've got to be go back under the law after I've been redeemed from the law, then I'm a, I'm a transgressor if I'm doing such a thing as that. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Did you see what he said here? We who've trusted Christ, we've died to that old law. We've been raised and we have been freed from the judgment of the law. Christ took our judgment for us and we are free in Christ Jesus. By the way, for you Bible students, do you know that the Sabbath was a picture of something? The Sabbath is a picture of rest. God created uh, all the earth in six days and on the seventh day he rested from his works. And remember in the book of Hebrews, he said, that was a picture of those who have tried to work our way to heaven and doing our own works. And we cease from our own works and receive the finished work of Christ. And he is our Sabbath for us. And so we entered into the rest 
of the Lord when we receive Christ as our Savior. And that was just a shadow. Jesus is the reality. All right, now watch what he said. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I'm so identified with Christ that when he died on the cross, I died with him in the reckoning of God. I died to all my sins that were against me, the handwriting of ordinances that was against me. He died, I died, I was crucified. That's already been carried out. And now I am raised with Christ, with new life. Therefore, there's no condemnation of them that are in Christ Jesus. And so I'm free from condemnation. And so I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the marvel of a Christian life, when we come to the place where it's no longer us, but we're so separated from the world and under the Lord that his life is really our life. If ye then be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. And so he's saying here, I'm crucified, I've died, and now it's his life in me, no longer I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. Faith of the Son is faith in the Son of God, who gave himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Did you see what he said? If anybody could be saved by keeping the law, Christ should never have died on the cross. It was the greatest injustice in the history of the universe. If God put his son on the cross, if we could be saved any other way. So he said, I, I don't frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come any other way, then Christ should never have died. And we certainly know there was no other way that we could be saved. And so, Understand tonight, the reason he puts this in here, and the reason he had to straight Peter out when he was all crooked in this matter, and a hypocrite, was the fact that we are saved by grace. Not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We receive the finished work of Christ. It is done, it is bought, it is paid for, it is finished, we receive Christ. When we do, we receive God's righteousness on our account, our sins on his account, and we are declared to be righteous in God's sight. Amen. Not in ourselves, but in the finished work of Christ. Christ is our righteousness. Now, let me ask you this. Is there any unrighteousness in Christ? So, before God, are you righteous? If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, how is your standing? Absolutely perfect. Now, your husband doesn't think you're perfect, or your wife doesn't think you're perfect. But God looks at you and says, you're absolutely perfect. Because the righteousness of Jesus is on your account. And all of your sins were put on his account. He paid for all of your sins, and he declared you righteous in the sight of God. Amen. That's why we have eternal salvation. That's why we're saved for all eternity. That's why we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're righteous in God's sight. Now, is there anyone that's any more righteous in God's sight than anybody else? No, because you can't get any more righteous than the righteousness of Jesus. And that righteousness is on your account. Marvel in that. That's why we rejoice in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We're in his righteousness. And the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 4 that blessed is a man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He can never put sin on our account because Jesus died for all of our sins and he already put it on his account. It's all done. And we're righteous in his sight. 
Blessed be God for the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. Marvel in it. Glory in it. Glory in Him who is your righteousness. Now, we're not under bondage to the law. Everybody understands that? We're not under bondage to the days and weeks and times and years and Sabbath days and the drinking and all of the things of the law, all of those laws. We're free from that, and we are free in Christ Jesus from the works of the law. Well, does that make us free to do anything we want to do? No, no, no. We're now in law to Christ. And uh, we have the law of the Spirit in us, and that law of the Spirit teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. And he gave himself that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And so our lives are changed. We are not under the law. We're not under any bondage there. But there's another way that we're not under bondage. I want you to watch this. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 8. The 8th chapter of John. And Jesus speaking now to the uh, group of people that were around him, and most of them were Pharisees, and all of them, in this case, were Jewish people. And uh, in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus speaking, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You've got to get free from any bondage. All right, now watch it. They answered to him, We be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? Now there's two things there. These Jews were full of pride, and they're also liars. Because everybody knows the Jews were in bondage, both down in Egypt and also over in Babylon. And we were never in bondage. <laughs> no, not much, <laughs> except for about 470 years. <laughs> So they were in bondage. But he said, he said we're not, we've never been under bondage to any man. Jesus answered, verse 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now the word committeth there is in the continual sense, and it means he lives in sin. A person who's living in sin becomes a slave to that sin. Not a single person who ever took a drink ever said, I'm going to become an alcoholic. <gasps> Not one. Not one person who took that first drag or that first shot or whatever ever said, I'm going to become an addict. No one ever said that. No one ever planned that. Everyone who ever became an addict, whether to drugs or alcohol or whatever it might be, they thought they could play with it and it would be okay. They could quit any time they want to. Alfred Hale, who was a deacon in my home church, said, nobody could tell me I couldn't quit. I quit every Sunday morning, every Monday morning. Uh, for years and years I quit. <laughs> but he started back, but he, he quit every week. And the thing about sin is it sin has a grip. And the more you play with it, the more it enslaves you. Everyone here has heard this story, how we used to illustrate it to kids. And we used to do this all the time. We'd bring a kid up, you know, he's about 10 years of age, and we'd have some string, and we'd tie it around his uh, finger and tie two fingers together and say, now break that. Yeah, he could break it. It's just a piece of string. And then we'd put two rounds, hey, a little later, he could break it, and maybe three, oh, he could break it, but the more you put on it, the harder it was, and then he finally got where he could not break it. And so it is with sin. He that practices sin becomes a slave of sin. And no matter how smart we think we are, 
no matter how strong we think we are, if we play with sin, we become enslaved to sin. It's a reality. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And, and we must be really careful. Uh, we all know of those things that we try to break. And we got that every year, New Year's resolutions. By January 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they go get broken up. And how many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution that you kept and never, ever broke it? I'm looking for hands. <laughs> she, she broke so many she quit making them. <laughs> you see, the truth is, we are actually enslaving ourselves to sin when we practice sin. Can Christians get enslaved? Yes, they can. Yeah. And we have to be careful, too, lest we become slaves to our own lust and our own sin. And so he says, Jesus said, though, I want you to get this. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Verse 36 there, brother, if you put that up. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so we who are saved are no longer under bondage to the law. We don't answer to the law. We died to the law. And so the law has no effect on us. We also have been made free from sin. We don't have to sin. If we sin, it's because we make that choice. And folk, that makes, it, makes us more guilty, doesn't it? I mean, we have been made free we don't have to sin. Now, we can, get, we can sin so much that it's easy to sin. And by the way, it's easier not to sin the first time than it is not to sin the second time. Amen. The more you commit sin, the easier it is to commit sin. And so we need to be a pure people who say, no, I'm not going to sin. I'm going to separate myself from that, and I'm going to do my best to live for God and not yield myself to the temptations of the flesh. All right, so Christians, free from the law. Isn't that great? You're also free from sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you're under grace and not under law. Therefore, you're free. Christ has made us free. All right, now I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 2, and I have another verse I want to share with you. And if you look in Hebrews chapter 2, and we look at verse 15, that's 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus became human. He was always God, but he added humanity. He was God's perfect man and man's perfect God. He had a human soul, a human spirit, a human body, but he was God in a human body. God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now watch what it says. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, is everybody here there? You're all partakers of flesh and blood? Okay. Uh, I'm glad of that. Yeah. Uh, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So he was human just like we are. That through death he might destroy him, Satan, that had the power of death. That is the devil. The devil had the power of death, life and death. But now he no longer has the power of life and death. Jesus said, fear not him that is able to destroy the body, but is not able to destroy the soul. Rather, fear him that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. He's talking about God the Father. Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. Now Jesus has all power in heaven and earth. He's the Lord. 
Well, you know the scripture that says that Jesus left the glory of heaven and he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, was in all forms always like God, equal to the Father, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon the form of human flesh, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee shall bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Everyone's going to bow to Jesus one day, either here while they're living or after they face him in judgment. But every knee's going to bow and every tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now Jesus is victorious. Now watch in verse 15. Talking about Jesus. Who, uh, and delivered them, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We are no longer in bondage to the fear of death. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that a wonderful thought? Some people are absolutely in bondage to the fear of death. They're looking forward to judgment. And they quake at the thought. That's why they can force vaccines on the whole world because of the fear of death. Oh, I'm going to tell you, we're going to die anyway. Whether you're vaccinated or not, you're still going to die. And we ought not to live under fear. No Christian ought to fear death. Amen. Satan had the power, but he no longer has the power. Our lives are in his hands. I, my life is in his hands. Nobody can take my life. He's the Lord of life. And no longer do we fear death. If you know the Lord is your Savior, you look at death and you say, Well, death, you don't have any sting on me. <laughs> I just step out of time into eternity. I get rid of this old body and get me a new one. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. No more pain, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death. Glory to God, I'm going to be walking on the streets of glory. And we don't have any fear of death. Why should we? He takes away the fear of death. Yesterday, I met with a family. Linda Garber is sitting here. Her, her daughter, Angie, had passed away. And you folk know, we have a memorial service on this coming Saturday, the 22nd, at noon. And uh, we were talking about Angie. And uh, they said, uh, well, you know, Angie had trusted Christ as her Savior, she had been saved, and she had been baptized, and she was a member of the church. And, you know, she had absolutely no fear of death whatsoever. They said, you know, it was only a couple of weeks ago or so that she uh, had been suffering pain for quite some time but wouldn't go to the doctor. Some of you are just like that. You fear a doctor more than you fear death. Finally, she had so much pain, so much discomfort that they just almost forced her to go to the doctor. And when they did, the doctor discovered that the cancer was so far spread there was nothing they could do whatsoever. No chemotherapy, no radiation, no operation, nothing in the realm of humankind could ever do her any good. She has about two weeks to live. I, I visited her in the hospital. Then I visited her again in the home. And you know, she had no fear whatsoever of death. Not a bit in the world. She talked about heaven. She talked about going to be with the Lord. And she had absolutely, she said, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just going to be with Jesus. Amen. And that's the way it is. And one of the great things about Christians is we die well. We die well. 
because we're just going to be absent with the body, present with the Lord, and all is well to the child of God. And so we're not in bondage to the fear of death, not in bondage to the law, not in bondage to sin, and not in bondage to the fear of death. Praise God for the liberty that we have in Christ. I want to close with this verse. Back over in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. And uh, Terry, if you can uh, quickly put it back over there. Galatians 5, 1. And this is a command to you tonight to go home with. Okay? Galatians 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't get back under bondage, under anything. Have freedom to live for Christ and walk in the Spirit.